Okay. Okay. So it's a it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor David uh, Goldhaber Gordon here with us today. Professor uh, David got his bachelor's uh, at Harvard, uh, major in physics and a minor in, in history of science in 1994. He went on to get a PhD at MIT uh, under the supervision of uh, Mark Kastner, by Mark, uh, Mark Kastner, in 1999. And uh, uh, in 1998, he, he published a, a very important paper on uh, Condo physics in quantum dots, which opened an area of research that uh, myself and, uh, and Edson uh, are working on you today. Uh, after that, he's, he was a junior fellow in Harvard from 1999 to 2001. He was hired as an assistant professor in Stanford in 2001. And if I am not mistaken, he has been a full professor uh, in Stanford since 2000. And today he's going to talk to us uh, about electrons in twisted layers, design, and surprise. So, uh, Professor Gordon, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, the microphone is yours. So, thank you very much, George, and thanks thanks for the gracious in introduction and the invitation. Um, since I can't uh, with this platform, I can't see people on the screen. Um, if um, if there are questions during the presentation, especially things that you're not understanding, please don't hesitate to ask. It, it may be that Edson has a way for people to um, to flag that they have questions, but if if not, I'm happy for people to just call out and ask. If there's something that you just want to know more about, then then we can wait till the end of the presentation, but if there's something you're confused about, it's likely that others are, and uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, Edson, do you have any guidance on that? Yeah, I, 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 I will be checking, and if there are any questions, I, I will flag you. Great, thanks very okay. much. Thank you. So I imagine that, um, that many, I, mean, I imagine that pretty much all of you have heard of graphene. Some of you may be <clears throat> deeply engaged with it uh, since I, I think it's uh, probably a diverse audience. I'm going to um, start with some rather um, basic contexts and then uh, dig into my philosophy of it. But um, today I'm going to be telling you about two two vignettes, two little stories <clears throat> about new kinds of behavior that can happen when you stack atomically thin layers on each other. And um, the fact that we can, we can plan some things, we can design some of this behavior, um, but surprises also come. And there are cases where we do not yet have full control of these systems and so that's something that I'm, uh, um, I'll tell you about maybe at the end that I'm working on trying to enhance the ability to control these systems. So, so let's start with a very um, old material, uh, graphite. Um, so shown on the left, I'm not sure whether people can see my um, mouse pointer, but this is a, a chunk of graphite. Uh, it's one of the forms of carbon. Uh, it's a component of what you have in a pencil. Um, and um, the reason that it's useful in pencils is that this is material is made up of uh, atomic layers that are tightly bonded within the layer, but that can slip easily with respect to uh, one layer with respect to another, uh, therefore easily depositing um, a set of layers on uh, on paper and uh, so graph graphite is a very um, very old material uh, that occurs in nature um, and uh, as I think many of you know um, uh, uh, a bit more than 15 years ago on um, uh, Andre Geim and uh, Kostya Novoselov uh, in Manchester, uh, we're playing around with um, 
uh, with scotch tape and peeling off uh, layers from, um, from graphite. And they found that they could deposit single atomically thin layers on, um, on another surface. And then they could remarkably put electrical contacts to that and measure how electrons behaved in that material, just one atom thin. Um, so let me give you uh, some context for what you would expect. Uh, first of all, uh, one layer of graphite is not simply thin graphite. Uh, it's not just uh, a smaller amount of graphite. It actually has quite different electronic properties. And in particular, um, it turns out that uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the fact that we can try to describe electrons and materials by plotting uh, energy as a function of momentum. So just like um, for when you throw a baseball, uh, the kinetic energy of the baseball goes as the velocity squared or the momentum squared. Um, in, in most materials, electrons tend to have uh, an energy that goes uh, quadratically with momentum. Um, um, but that's not the case in, in graphene. Um, in graphene, energy is linearly proportional to momentum. And uh, that may be familiar to you from a different context. Um, photons, light, uh, has energy that's linearly proportional to momentum. And so there have been a lot of analogies drawn between graphene and light, or more specifically graphene and massless fermion, electrons in graphene and massless fermions, something like a neutrino, which has a very tiny mass. So, so that's already very unusual. And we'll come back to that energy momentum relationship. Um, but as I mentioned, this is not like graphite. And in fact, if you start putting layers together of graphene, you get different properties. So first, let me show you something that's imaginary. Uh, if you were to put two layers of graphene, one on top of each other in a way that every, every atom sits right atop one other atom, then you would get uh, a so-called AA bilayer um, because, um, well, uh, let me just leave it at that. Um, and it would have a more complex structure uh, with two copies of this energy linearly proportional to momentum, but the two are shifted uh, to, uh, to zero, having their zeros at different momentum. This is not a physically, energetically uh, favorable structure. In fact, in natural graphite, the way that uh, layers sit are so-called Bernal stacking or AB stacking, where uh, if you have one layer, then the next layer will have half its atoms on top of atoms of the first layer and the other half of the atoms uh, above the holes in the hexagons in the layer below. And you can see there's a dramatically different expected uh, energy versus momentum. In fact, it may look kind of quadratic. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, but I just wanted to give you the sense that uh, the details of stacking matter a lot. Uh, and so now, uh, about a decade ago, uh, a number of uh, theorists suggested, and most, I think most pointedly, um, though not first, uh, Rafi Bistritzer and Alan, Alan McDonald uh, suggested that there could be really interesting properties if you look at uh, graphene that's stacked on another piece of graphene with a twist between the two. And um, so not, not just stacked uh, in the sort of simple periodic relations that I showed you, but with a, a small twist between the layers. And what you can see here is if you have a twist between the two layers, the two layers go in and out of registry with each other, and you get a pattern um, that shows up on a scale much larger than the atomic lattice scale um, as the two go in and out of registry. And so these different appearing regions uh, one region is actually this very energetically unfavorable AA stacking. Uh, and then you have other regions that are BA, BA or AB stacking, depending on um, which 
which atoms in the first layer, the second layer sit, sits on top of. Uh, and this, this so-called Moray structure um, is um, an analogy, is analogous in, in real space to something that those of you who play musical instruments may be familiar with uh, when you're trying to tune up your instrument. If, if two players are playing supposedly the same note, the same frequency of sound, but they're slightly off from each other, um, then what you hear is a sort of beat as the two sound waves go in and out of registry with each other. This is the same thing happening spatially instead of in time and in two dimensions instead of in one. So, um, all right, so what does this Moiré structure do? First of all, those of you who are familiar with the theory of electrons and solids um, know that um, the, the, the properties of electron waves depend on the fact that they're living in a periodic potential that is imposed by the crystal lattice. And so what you can see here is that effectively you're creating a new period on a new scale. And you might imagine that it would change the electronic properties of the system. And <clears throat> indeed that's the case. Um, now I'm showing you uh, a more complex diagram. Uh, this is in momentum space. It turns out that the electrons in graphene are not, um, not around zero momentum. Uh, the low energy states are actually around quite high momentum, meaning very, uh, very short spatial periods of the waves, uh, the so-called K, K point. And if you have two, two layers twisted with respect to each other, these K points are going to be in different directions in momentum space and thus in real space. And um, it turns out that this produces a, a new structure, a new so-called Brillouin zone in, uh, in momentum space. And one way to think about this is by looking just very near <clears throat> these points of zero energy where you have energy linearly proportional to momentum. Momentum can be in either direction in two dimensions. So this, this forms a cone if you think of energy uh, as a function of momentum in two directions. And you can see that if you have two cones, one for each layer that are starting at different points in momentum space, then the two cones are going to cross each other. And one thing that we know that's very <clears throat> basic in quantum mechanics is that unless there's a symmetry reason forbidding it, when two states have the same energy, um, a reorganization occurs so that um, they, they hybridize with each other and you have one energy below and one energy above. And indeed that should happen in this case. So you should get a splitting instead of having two overlapping cones where the two cones overlap, you form a gap, a region of energy where there are no states available. Um, and uh, when you, for electrons in a material, when there's a gap, that means you can have an insulator. You can have a state that cannot electrically conduct. So what happens as we go down to smaller and smaller twist angle is that this gap is going to move uh, closer and closer to zero energy. And <clears throat> so eventually you might expect that you would actually flatten this energy versus momentum, this band structure. Um, so I, I apologize, is the noise bad from outside? I can, I can hear anything, your, vo your voice is fine. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so yes, I, I love the ability to pull signal out of noise. Um, so, uh, so eventually this band structure should become flat, meaning energy is independent of momentum. And you might think, and it turns out that one can predict what twist angle this should occur at because it's known what size this gap should be. And so if you, um, if you equate the size of that gap to um, the velocity of electrons uh, in, in a single layer of graphene um, times the shift in momentum between the two layers due to the angle, uh, then you can predict what angle this should occur at. 
and um, uh, Bistritzer and McDonald predicted that at about 1.1 degree twist angle, you should get this condition of a flat bend. So why is, um, why is that uh, more than a curiosity? Um, it's because um, having energy independent of momentum upends the paradigm that we use to understand electrons in ordinary metals or semiconductors. So ordinarily, we have energy that is a strong function of momentum, a strong function of wavelength of the electrons in the system. And what that means is that if we have a certain number of electrons filling a material, they will fill all the kinetic energy states, all, uh, all the energy states in this sort of band structure up to a certain energy, and then you run out of electrons. And they're, so all the states below are filled, all the states above are empty. And that turns out to be a very powerful way of understanding um, electronic properties of materials. But if energy is independent of momentum, then how do we decide which states electrons should fill and which states should be left empty? And uh, there's no reason based on their kinetic energy. <clears throat> and so it turns out that gives an opportunity to fill states based on how the electrons can avoid each other most efficiently, how they can minimize their Coulomb repulsion. And so, um, so then when Coulomb interactions determine the complex dance of electrons, essentially anything can happen. You can get superconductors, you can get magnets, um, uh, electrons can organize themselves uh, into um, striped, um, striped patterns called charge density waves. And so that's really a kind of exciting thing for people studying electrons and solids. If you can design a system where um, Coulomb interactions should be very important, uh, and, uh, and so this seemed like a place where such design could be done, but it also seemed like a really hard thing to do. And so relatively few groups, uh, uh, experimental groups, seriously pursued twisted um, graphene studies. Uh, one group that did even before some of this theory was Eva Andre's group at Rutgers on uh, studying with scanning tunneling microscopy. And there were other important efforts, um, but, um, but I'd like to focus on uh, something really exciting that happened on um, about four years ago on um, the group of Pablo Rio Herrero at MIT um, uh, observed that in a system like this, um, as you tuned the density of electrons in the system, which it turns out you can do in a way inspired by transistors in computer chips uh, with a nearby electrode called a gate, um, uh, at very low temperatures, <clears throat> there were densities at which the material became superconducting and densities where it had an unusual type of insulator that um, they uh, identified as have being caused by electrical correlations. And so that was really, um, really exciting and led to a lot of other groups trying to, uh, to work on this. Uh, there was a rel relatively soon another group reproduced this work and extended it in some ways. This was at Columbia. Um, Matt Yankowitz was the first author of this. Um, and uh, and these, this new type of insulator uh, was occurring when you put two electrons in every uh, period of this, uh, of this moiré, of this larger lattice. And the superconductor occurred very nearby that. And uh, the idea of having a correlated insulator and then when you add electrons or add holes to it, that you could get a superconductor was something that has been very much on the physics world's mind for decades because of um, superconductivity in the high temperature cuprate superconductors where that seems to happen. So this got people really excited for a number of reasons that there could be something reminiscent of the high temperature superconductors, uh, but in a system that was chemically much simpler and with uh, this tuning parameter, this control of twist angle. So that was really exciting. And in fact, 
when more careful calculations were done, considering how the two layers could adjust each other and adjust uh, one layer to the other uh, and move their atoms around to find a lower energy configuration, avoiding that, that AA stacking that I talked about, it turns out not only should the um, band uh, become flat, but it should actually become separated from other electron states by a substantial gap. Uh, and so this this is was really an exciting system, and my group um, uh, tried to uh, to reproduce this. Um, and so the way that these samples are made, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, that graphene is uh, produced by putting typically produced by putting tape on a surface uh, on a graphite um, crystal, peeling it off. Turns out you fold it together a number of times, then press the tape against some other substrate, peel it off, and you end up with uh, a range of different thin layers of graphene. And if you take a good optical microscope, um, you can search this chip and you can find layers that in some cases are just one atom thick. And that, that actually you know, uh, was the key technology that allowed uh, um, that allowed the work by Andre Geim's group uh, on graphene initially. But the technology, the technology for making single layers of graphene has largely stayed there in that same situation. I'll mention something else at the end, but um, but the technology for making a really clean um, sample of graphene has evolved, and it turns out that now graphene can be sandwiched between insulating layers so it's protected from its environment uh, and then contacts can be made to the edge of the graphene uh, so that you can do electrical measurements on it this was developed this technique was developed at Columbia in 2013 and that's what we've applied we and others have applied to this twisted graphene layer uh, with an extra uh, an extra trick that uh, that how do you make a controllable twist angle? You can take one piece of graphene, you can tear off half of it, uh, and then rotate by a known angle and put it down on the other piece of graphene uh, to get a known twist angle. So in any case, um, we we uh, made a sample. Um, and just to uh, mention what makes this possible, this this subfield of 2D materials has been very cooperative and friendly and uh, starting with the um, people who pioneered the fields, Andre Geim and Philip Kim, um, groups have been very generous in showing others how to do things. And, uh, then, um, and then those groups um, pass, pass that forward to others. And so when we wanted to learn how to make a very controlled twist angle, we had already been working on graphene for a while, uh, but my student, Aaron Sharp, flew to Boston in what turned out to be a blizzard uh, and um, and visited um, Pablo Herrero Herrero's lab for a day and they uh, showed us what their technique was and uh, then we um, built apparatus for that and uh, and carried that forward and so this is a sample uh, you can see it's a few microns in size and it has um, six contacts so we can drive a current and measure voltages and then there are gate electrodes that allow us to tune the density of carriers and here's an example of how the uh, conduction through the system looks i'm plotting on a color scale the resistance measured um, um, the voltage between two of these contacts when we drive a current uh, normalized to that current so on a color scale plotting the resistance um, uh, as a function of two gate voltages. It turns out we have an electrode on the top and one on the bottom. And so if you change those voltages in opposite directions, you stay on one of these similar colored lines. That's where the density of electrons in the graphene, the twisted bilayer graphene is remaining the same, but um, you're changing the electric field normal to the plane, the so-called displacement field. But if you go in the opposite, um, in a different direction, you're changing the density of electrons in this twisted bilayer graphene um, without changing the electric field normal to the plane. And 
some features that you may notice are this, this feature at um, so-called charge neutrality point. That's where you have zero extra electrons in the twisted bilayer graphene. It's, um, and uh, up here is where you have four electrons for every one of those Moray cells. Uh, and that's expected to be an insulator where you've completely filled the band and now your Fermi level is in a gap. Um, and similarly down here, we've pulled four electrons out for every more A cell. And again, there's a high resistance. Um, so those are maybe the first features that jump out. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into every feature that we see here, but let me um, say to start, we were pretty disappointed because we did not see superconductivity in this sample. Um, but, uh, but Aaron, who had um, made and was studying the sample, decided to you know, keep investigating it. And one thing that he did just to determine what density of electrons we had in the sample was to measure the Hall effect. Uh, so, um, so as you uh, may know, if you put on a magnetic field, electrons get, and you drive a current, electrons get deflected by the field, by the, um, uh, 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 they're deflected in one direction. And so you build up a voltage between the two um, sides of a sample. And uh, so you can measure that Hall voltage. Um, and uh, that's generally proportional to magnetic field at low fields. Uh, and it also, allows you to extract the carrier density because the fewer electrons there are, the, it turns out the higher the Hall voltage. So here you can see the slope of the Hall effect as a function of magnetic field. These are low magnetic fields. This is a 10th of a Tesla. Um, and you can see that there's a, a linear slope uh, with magnetic fields here. This is at cryogenic temperatures, but not ultra low, one and a half Kelvin. And here I'm showing you the case that um, has, we now know about an, uh, an eighth filling of the band or half an electron per more A cell. Um, when we go to um, a higher filling, let's say two electrons per more A cell, again, you know, now we have an even uh, smaller Hall slope. Again, it looks pretty simple. Uh, then we can go to two and a half electrons per more A cell. So we can, um, look carefully and measure the Hall slope and extract density. Um, and, uh, but then at three electrons per more A cell, it looks a bit different. Uh, in fact, dramatically different. The Hall effect, the Hall slope is quite large, even at very low magnetic fields. And it's no longer linear, it saturates uh, at these low fields. And so that was really quite striking and surprising. And so Aaron decided to cool this down in a fancier cryostat that could go to lower temperatures. And here's what he saw. Um, he saw that um, indeed there's a pretty sharp drop in the Hall or pretty sharp transition in the Hall signal near when you go through zero magnetic field. And then when you come back, again, there's a pretty sharp jump, but these don't occur actually right at zero field. They're separated a bit, there's hysteresis. And so if you sweep the field and come back to zero, there's a memory of the history of this. Um, and, um, and there are a few things that are striking about this. First of all, this is a signal that is not just based on the density of carriers um, and the magnetic field. It's affected by, uh, it, it appears that it's affected by a magnetization. Um, when you see this sort of uh, Hall signal at zero magnetic field, um, it's what's called an anomalous Hall effect. It's not uh, as opposed to the Hall effect that was um, produced by a magnetic field. It's produced instead by a magnetization. In fact, um, Edwin Hall um, discovered that effect um, very soon after the ordinary Hall effect uh, nearly 150 years ago. Um, uh, and it's, it's used as a way to characterize magnets. But this is an un this is an anomalously large anomalous Hall signal. So normally uh, in metals you see anomalous Hall signals that are milli ohms, thousandth of an ohm. One ohm is a big anomalous Hall signal. This this the biggest Hall uh, signal we see. It's it's not symmetric about zero, but it's 
about plus or minus 10 kilo ohms. That's huge. And in fact, it's suggestive. It's getting on the order of the quantum of resistance, uh, a resistance made up of universal constants of nature, H over E squared, which is about 26 kilo ohms. And it's many of you may know that that's um, something that's seen in the quantum Hall effect. So this was really striking. And by the way, let me point out that this is at two Kelvin. So it wasn't actually colder than the other measurement, but it was in a better filtered cryostat. So uh, the electrons were in a quieter electromagnetic environment. Um, so it turns out this is ferromagnetism. We've made a magnet out of carbon. Uh, and that's really surprising uh, on the face of it. I mean, normally we, we think of um, magnetism is occurring in cobalt or iron or nickel, um, but not in carbon. Um, and um, it turns out that this uh, large anomalous Hall effect occurs only near three quarters filling of the moiré, where we have three electrons for every moiré cell, uh, or one hole, one missing electron uh, in this in this band for every moiré cell. Uh, there are a lot of details here, but um, uh, I'm going to um, skip over that to uh, so that we can um, you know, cover more more ground. But let me just sh flash up a couple of things about this. One is that it seems like this magnet has little domains that are flipping in a reproducible way. Uh, every time you sweep the magnetic field. So you see these jumps in the Hall signal that occur basically at the same field each time. Also, it's stable uh, in zero field. So uh, we did a hysteresis loop uh, in field, came back to zero field, waited for six hours. The Hall signal barely changed. And then we continued on, and it was as if we had never waited. So this is a stable magnet, albeit at, at low temperature. Um, how low a temperature, it turns out the magnet remains magnetic up to about four Kelvin or five Kelvin, depending on what measure you use for it. And this is about the temperature uh, of, at which liquid helium boils. So very low, but not um, an extreme condition for, uh, for condensed matter physics. And, um, uh, and so in, in terms of why did we see something that was so different from what had been seen before uh, in this uh, system? Um, it turns out that there was something that we had done unintentionally. So when we, uh, when Aaron looked back at the pictures he had taken while making the sample, he noticed that an edge of the graphene was at essentially the same, it was parallel to an edge of the boron nitride, the insulating layer that was used to encapsulate it, to protect it from the outside world. And um, so this, this turns out to have an impact. And um, so since then we've measured lots of devices that were not aligned with boron nitride. And that, that was the case for most of the other samples people had looked at. And uh, the, on the face of it, the conduction looks rather similar, but if you look at the details, it turns out that there are a number of clues that something is different here. The resistance scale is much higher uh, in, uh, in the aligned case. And that's something that um, for those of you who are familiar with graphene, you know that at the charge neutrality point, you don't expect a really extremely insulating state. Um, and here you get a much higher resistance than you'd expect normally for graphene. Uh, there are also the effect of applying an electric field normal to the plane um, uh, in, um, in the misaligned case, it has almost no effect. But in the aligned case, you can see that some of these fillings, there's a pretty strong effect of applying a field normal to the plane. Um, and um, so, you know, I like these, these color plots can make things jump out for you, but I like to say that the um, color plots can hide a multitude of sins, it, you know, you can't really tell the quantitative details. So let me just show you line cuts here. Um, here for the misaligned case, you can see that there's a resistance at the charge neutrality point of two kilo ohms or so. That's very typical for graphene, but here it goes up to 100 kilo ohms. So as I mentioned, it was a much higher resistance. 
also you can see features on uh, not only at fulfilling but at somewhere beyond fulfilling near there and these turn out to be associated with the pattern made by graphene and hbn uh, hexagonal boron nitride um, they too make another moray pattern uh, so so there are some things that are different and in fact you know, we might not have been, perhaps we shouldn't have been shocked that something should have been changed when the boron nitride was aligned with the graphene uh, because my group and Pablo Rio Herrero's group had both seen some years before that uh, you could get very resistive behavior in graphene at the charge neutrality point uh, when it was on boron nitride, especially um, in Pablo's case, he showed that that was when the there was alignment with the boron nitride and that's associated with breaking a, a symmetry of the system that guarantees graphene is conducting at the charge neutrality point. So, um, so okay, that uh, that makes some sense. Um, so, what's what's going on here? Uh, the clues that we have are there's a really large anomalous Hall effect. Uh, we seem to see an insulating state. Uh, I haven't gone through the details of that, but this state seems. Um, to, if we look at the conductivity, the conductivity is dropping as we go down in temperature. Um, we see domains that are magnetized in different directions. This looks a lot like early work on topological insulators uh, that were magnetized. And uh, those are analogs to the quantum Hall effect. Uh, and so it made us think maybe this is what's called a churn insulator, an analog of the quantum Hall effect at zero magnetic field, where the um, uh, the resistivity and for those of you who know also the conductivity go to zero. Um, uh, that's but the off diagonal terms um, are uh, this quantum of resistance or quantum of conductance. So um, so we were seeing something on this order. We weren't seeing zero in resistivity, but if this is what's happening, why would that be happening? Um, why would it be happening when we put three electrons in a band that can hold four electrons per moray cell? Um, so if you have a band that has a set of states that have this density as a function of energy and you fill it three quarters full, nothing special should happen. It should look like a metal, a conductor. Um, but if interactions cause this band to split into four separate bands that uh, that you want to fill um, states with a particular spin and a particular orbital degree of freedom, um, fill all of those states before you fill the next set, then you could end up filling three of these and not the fourth. And then you might expect to get something that looks like um, a quantum Hall effect. Um, and so that's what we thought um, might be happening uh, based on our thinking and discussion with theorists. Um, and indeed, you know, after we showed our results, uh, a number of theory theories came out for how you could get this kind of behavior uh, if you add boron nitride aligned with twisted bilayer graphene, or even you just had electron interactions causing organization in this way. Um, and indeed, um, when we started talking about this and said, you know, it seems like a key here is alignment of graphene with boron nitride. Uh, uh, the group of Andrea Young uh, searched their, their library of samples and found a sample that seemed to have alignment with boron nitride. And when they measured um, uh, electron flow between four contacts near one end of that sample, they actually found uh, that, at, as we could only guess, that the Hall effect was in fact quantized near zero magnetic field. So they were able to reproduce our work and extend it in a beautiful way. Um, and um, uh, we found, and Andrea's group uh, verified uh, something that was also surprising that we didn't need to switch the magnet with a magnetic field. We could actually switch it by driving a current in the plane, a very tiny current. Uh, and so you can see we can go around this loop reproducibly and uh, switch the magnetic state as read out by the Hall effect, uh, and uh, they showed this uh, this similarly. Um, and this is really pretty striking because being able to switch a magnet electrically is 
attractive for um, for storing information uh, in memory in a computer. Now, you might say, all right, this is ridiculous. This works at cryogenic temperatures. Andrea's group got it to uh, show this sort of behavior a little higher up to close to 10 Kelvin, but still you know, extremely low temperatures. Uh, but bear with me, uh, there is a case where you'd want memory at low temperatures, which is if you want to control a quantum computer, you're going to need a classical computer, ideally located really near the quantum computer. And it turns out that one of the very difficult things to do at low temperature is produce a memory that doesn't, um, that doesn't burn a lot of energy and produce a lot of heat at those low temperatures. And it turns out that this, uh, this magnetic switching occurs at current densities that are three to four orders of magnitude lower than any, any other case that people have shown for um, electrical switching of, uh, of, of magnetism. Um, you know, there are commercial, um, commercial products that have spin transfer torque or spin orbit torque to switch little magnets, but this is orders of magnitude lower current. And so it ends up at perhaps as much as a million times lower power for switching than conventional um, uh, magnetic memory. Uh, and so this this could be pretty interesting in a niche application for um, memory for a classical computer to talk to a quantum computer. So what is happening with this magnetism? Uh, one thing we can do is not just apply a magnetic field normal to the plane, but tilt the magnetic field. And so together with a um, with a company Attocube, we um, designed a rotator that could rotate a sample in uh, two different directions. Um, so we could change the, the angle um, in particular of the sample relative to the uh, magnetic field. And, um, and so, I'm not going to go into this in detail, but there are different exotic scenarios for what could be happening in this magnet. Uh, I only gave the simplest one, um, but if indeed the magnet is what something like what I'm showing, it's a magnet that's that's a kind that's never been seen before. Um, and so I'm, I'm blanking my screen for a moment just so that that complex picture is not distracting. Um, the magnetism in ordinary magnets is founded on, on electron spins, which act as tiny little magnets, all lining up with each other, and therefore in total producing a substantial magnetization. Um, but when I first uh, learned about magnetism in a class, um, I was told you know, magnetism comes from tiny circulating currents. And, uh, and then, then we were told that that was, as so often in physics, that was an oversimplification. It's not really circulating currents. It's spin, which has a magnetic moment, but there's no no actual circulating current. This this material seems to be the first example that's been seen near zero magnetic field where a magnet is actually formed from tiny little circulating currents, so a so-called orbital magnet. And so I think that's really quite cool. And if that's the case, we should expect that that there should be a very different response to field normal to the plane, which um, which um, acts on uh, sort of couples directly to these circulating currents that like to form uh, a magnetic moment up or down. And there should be a very different response if you put a, uh, a field in the plane. And so we decided to tilt the field and see what happened to our transport measurements. And so, um, at different tilt angles, ranging from perpendicular to the sample to only five degrees away from the plane, um, we get you know, this complex mess of behaviors of uh, Hall resistance as a function of magnetic field. But if we plot as a function of just the perpendicular component of the magnetic field, then all of these data collapse, at least at low fields, onto a single trace. So all that matters is the component of the field out of the plane. And that's a, a powerful indication that this is indeed an orbital magnet. Um, and um, so that's uh, that was really quite exciting. So um, so let me let me now say that 
it's been you know more than three years since our on um, since our work and it was really exciting that on, after only six months andrea young's group reproduced and extended it his group and my group have both um, made more measurements on our sample and learned more things about it and those remain the, the only two samples in the world of their kind there there have been hints in um, scanning tunneling microscopy measurements by um, uh, by Ali Yazdani's group and by um, uh, uh, and by Eva Andre's group and perhaps others uh, that locally there's some magnetism. There have been hints in transport and um, and other large area, well, transport and compressibility measurements from um, uh, Amir Kobe's group and um, uh, and um, Efetov's group, um, but there's been nothing that's shown something dramatic at uh, in switching at zero magnetic field like this. And so this is frustrating and puzzling. And so I'd like to go back to something that that I observed back when we first um, saw this behavior, and I was curious why it was happening. And we learned that boron nitride probably played a role. So I'm just going to show a cartoon that we made at that time of the spatial structure of the system. So here's one layer of graphene. Here's another layer. And the, these are cartoons, but but it's to scale. Um, and so you see the moiré pattern of the two. And now, again, to scale, I'm going to show you uh, the what happens when we put the boron nitride down. And you can see that the moiré that the boron nitride forms with one of the graphene layers is almost the same period, but also almost perfectly rotationally aligned to the more of the two graphene layers. And that's really striking. It didn't have to be that way. And so at the time I said, you know, there are two possibilities. One is that all that's important is that there's a small angle between this twisted bilayer graphene and the boron nitride, uh, and that breaks the symmetry in the system, which facilitates uh, this, uh, this formation of magnetization. Another possibility is that it actually matters that the, the uh, two mores are lined up with each other. And if so, there's a further bifurcation that could be something that likes to happen naturally, that nature favors that kind of locking in, or it could be that, um, that it's just an accident and we got ridiculously lucky. And so at the time I said, um, I don't believe that it's that third possibility that it matters um, that these mores align and that um, that there's nothing that really makes that lock in. It, we just got lucky. But I can say after trying to make many samples since then and other groups trying, uh, it seems like there's something more that's needed. Um, and in fact, um, there's theoretical support for the idea that my guess was right that uh, that these mores, uh, uh, the the joint more is important. Uh, so uh, sorry, I'll get to that. I'll get to that in a moment. I um, so there are other materials where people have seen on um, these kinds of orbital magnets in the past few years now after the the first this first case, there's work that uh, my group uh, um, did in collaboration with um, with Feng Wang's group at um, 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 uh, with Feng Wang's group at Berkeley and others in a different graphene-based system that's uh, that's not twisted. It's just stacked in a in a simpler way. Um, there there's other work on twisted monolayer bilayer graphene. There's work on 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 other materials, transition metal dichalcogenides uh, making a moiré. And um, so that's burgeoning, but um, but in this particular material system, we just have those two, two samples. Now, what may be going on, um, there was a um, theory by Alan McDonald's group um, last year um, and, uh, and also, common, also um, suggestions by Senthil and Paco Ganea uh, in separate work, that maybe this commensurability of the two mores matters. 
and uh, in particular, I'm showing from Alan McDonald's work that there's a sort of region where the two moraes should pretty much lie on top of each other if you properly match the twist angle between the two graphene layers and the twist angle between graphene and boron nitride. Um, and I'm plotting here our sample on this graph, which is not too far off from this blob, and Andrea Young's sample uh, that was more quantized and is in the blob. Um, there's ambiguity about whether Andrea Young's sample had uh, this twist angle or that one, but um, it's suggestive. So uh, the problem in this is that we're making, we're still making uh, these sandwiches in the same way that we had been making them uh, for many years. And uh, as Pablo uh, has said, trying to put two layers of graphene together and hope that they form a certain arrangement with each other, it's like trying to layer one, one sheet of saran wrap, a very thin plastic wrap on another. You expect to get wrinkles and strain and twist. And so um, we need to find new and better ways for getting that control, but at least we have a suggestion that what's important here is probably getting control of the twist angle for the two graphenes and also to the H, uh, hexagonal boron nitride. So this is how we're doing, uh, we've been doing the stacking. We did the stacking on that sample. It's a, you can see there are many manual manipulators and there are two motorized uh, manipulators for getting very fine control of the, bringing the layers together and the twist angle. But, um, but now uh, a colleague in my, and I, uh, Andy Mannix in material science in Stan at Stanford and I are building, uh, have built a system to do such stacking in vacuum with much more exquisite control. And um, this is building on work that Andy did in his postdoc uh, at Chicago with Ji Wong Park. Um, and I'm hopeful that that's going to allow us to control these sorts of things. So, um, so the problem is that every sample is different. There are many tuning knobs. I just showed you this hidden um, hidden control um, from uh, uh, the um, graphene boron nitride twist angle. We're extremely sensitive to um, parameters. And um, since I've, I, I went, I did more intro and went through this uh, more slowly than I expected. I'm not going to delve deeply into the uh, other topic I was going to tell you about, but let me just take a few minutes to uh, to introduce it to you and give you a flavor. So this is a second case where um, some hidden um, hidden parameter turned out to be very important in the properties of the system. So uh, so here was a case where we were trying to uh, reproduce this twisted bilayer. We ended up having something that appeared to be at a substantially larger twist angle. Um, we're now questioning wh whether we were really right about that, but uh, it, it's a small twist angle between two graphene layers. And you see that there's a peak in resistance at the charge neutrality point. It's a pretty normal, it's not what you'd expect for alignment with boron nitride. And there aren't very strong features until you completely fill or completely empty the band. Um, but this changes if we turn on a magnetic field. Um, and so as we increase the magnetic field, these sweeps uh, look very different. You can see that there's a rising resistance in this broad range of densities of electrons. And this can be as much as 300 times. Uh, this is a, a log scale on the resistance axis. This is really dramatic. And um, when we showed this to, uh, to theorists and experimentalists, um, they said, you know, this is beautiful and striking and I've never seen anything like it. And so we were having trouble figuring out what, what was going on. There were other strange things happening besides these magnetoresistance regions. So if you look in here, there's a lot of fast oscillations. If we look as a function of magnetic field, you see that there are wiggles. And these may be familiar to some of you. These look like shubnikov de Haas oscillations where we're filling and empty, emptying Landau levels. Um, but there's something funny, which is that each, each dip that should appear seems to be doubled. Uh, there's also this magneto resistance that I mentioned. Um, and so let's combine the sort of data that I've showed you so far into a color plot in two dimensions, field and density. And so here's the striking behavior. 
So there are all these lines radiating out from the charge neutrality point. These are Landau levels. Um, and then half the Landau levels terminate when we go into this region with magnetoresistance and the other half, each one splits into two. And then when they cross other Landau levels coming from fully empty bands, there's an, uh, a rich behavior. So again, I don't have time to go into all of the details of this, but this is a really striking set of behaviors and we, we had no idea why it was happening. And um, so, um, uh, so because we had a sample with many contacts and the ability to measure all of, the, all of them at the same time, we could see, all right, the twist angle is varying a little bit as we go across the sample and this magneto resistance seems to be occurring in a certain range of twist angle, but people had studied that twist angle, that sort of range of twist angle before and not seen those behaviors. So what was going on? Um, uh, my, my student, Joe Finney, got frustrated with, you know, we don't know what's happening and no one's able to explain it. So he started playing with a simple toy model called the Hofstadter butterfly model, which is for electrons in a periodic lattice in the presence of a magnetic field. It gives a beautiful spectrum of energies that's shown here that looks like a butterfly, hence the name. Um, and, um, and Joe started playing with adding additional terms to this model. Um, he added an anisotropy, um, so hopping different in, in the two directions. And he added doubling of the unit cell so that, um, um, so that um, electrons could also hop uh, two sites in one direction. Uh, and when he did this model and plotted what would be expected for um, as a function of magnetic field and density, he saw these sorts of behaviors that we see that half the Landau levels end, half the Landau levels split. They have this rich crossing behavior. And this was really, uh, really striking. And um, with the help of um, a uh, theorist, Daniel Parker, a postdoc at Harvard, uh, we um, saw that you didn't have to have this, uh, this next nearest neighbor hopping. You could just say there were two sets of electrons with different energies. Um, and um, this behavior really quite remarkably matches uh, the data. And we can do fine tuning of the parameters to, to get the match, but the qualitative behavior uh, is there for a wide range of these parameters. And uh, so that's really striking. And it's especially striking because the model is just for a square lattice, not a, a honeycomb lattice and not the complex behavior you'd expect for a moray. Uh, and so um, we had predictions, we've gone to the high magnetic field lab and been able to show that the splitting between the two sets of carriers really looks like Zeeman effect. Um, and uh, I'd like to, to wrap up now and just say that the people who did this work, uh, Aaron, um, who's now a post, uh, postdoc at Sandia National Lab, but still interacting with my group. And Joe Finney, who's a student in my group, led the two um, sets of work that I described. Eli Fox, another student in my group, played a key role, especially in the, the magnetism work. Uh, a bunch of other members of my group uh, played key roles. Uh, and um, uh, a number of um, experimental collaborators, I mentioned that the, the work on uh, on uh, trilayer graphene that was not twisted was with Feng Wang's group uh, and also with Yan Bo Zhang's group. Um, uh, and uh, so this has been really an exciting ride. And I hope that I've shown you that um, new types of behaviors can that are surprising can jump out. So we can design a system that has, that should show interesting behavior because of this flat band that should facilitate electron interactions playing a key role in um, in the behavior of a system. So we can, theorists can say, look in this approximate parameter space, and still we can be repeatedly surprised because systems are sensitive to tuning parameters that we didn't expect. Um, and I told you in the case of the, the second vignette that what Joe had to put in as, a, as an ingredient to understand this was uh, anisotropy. 
So difference in two directions. And we guess that this might be coming from strain uh, where the one of the layers is stretched relative to the other, for example. Um, you might imagine that could be that could happen as you're tearing the two layers apart in, in the stacking process. Um, and um, indeed, more very recently working with uh, Oscar Vafek um, uh, and uh, and his postdoc, um, we've been able to um, see that that surmise uh, that that strain is important is indeed correct that if we uh, put into a more detailed realistic model strain we actually can can get um, a pretty full explanation of the features we see and even features that we didn't notice in the experiment so uh, with that um, if, if there are questions i'd be happy to take them briefly i know we're we're running at the end of the hour uh, but um, uh, but I'm going to uh, stop sharing and uh, and um, so uh, then um, let me uh, let me know if there are questions. Thank you, thank you so much, David, for this very nice talk. Very interesting, very didactic, also. So uh, this uh, talk is open to questions. Does anyone uh, please? Uh, Either raise your hand or open your microphone and uh, make questions. Um, I I have I have one question. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I I understand from your um, from one diagram that you showed in the beginning that you put two uh, bottom nitrides to isolate the uh, the bilayer. Is that true or is just one on top? Uh, so, um, so uh, historically, uh, the first development with boron nitride was seeing that putting graphene on boron nitride um, instead of on, on silicon oxide, which is so boron nitride is atomically flat and uh, and very low disorder insulator. Um, and compared to putting graphene on silicon oxide, which is what most people had done before that, um, you could get much cleaner behavior, and that was a development also at Columbia University. Uh, Jim Hone um, was a key um, a key contributor to, uh, to to all of those developments, and there were other people who were important. Uh, but but more recently, uh, you know, since 2013. My group and others have mostly been fully encapsulating the graphene and boron nitride, and so there were two layers. Yes, uh, two layers. To, so to answer your implicit question, one of them was at a large twist angle, not close to alignment, and the other one was close to alignment. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask that if uh, both of them were aligned or just one was aligned. So it was just one that was aligned. Okay. Um, so and uh, what. Uh, is it uh, because you you it's it's surprising to me that the magnetism comes from the circulating currents. What can you? What is the origin of this circulating current? Would you talk a little bit more about that? So, so, uh, so if one calculates the wave functions of electrons in the system, so in in these in these bands, uh, it turns out that these bands can have topological character. And um, okay. so, you know, think about a quantum Hall system. Um, there, um, the states that you build it up out of are um, Lando levels, and you can describe the states in the Lando levels. One description would be as a set of little circulating um, current loops. It's basically similar there, and the, the wave functions look like three petal flowers. But with a phase that winds in one direction or the other, so they're, they're they have angular momentum, um, and so from detailed microscopic calculations in uh, a model of this twisted bilayer graphene, you can get um, wave functions that should have this um, this character. And then there's the question: Why do you selectively occupy ones that circulate one way and not the other? And that's basically because of a part of the Coulomb interaction, the so-called exchange part of the Coulomb interaction. I, I know you're familiar, but I'm using terminology for the broader audience that leads 
uh, that is a, a local, a, a short range reduction of the repulsion between electrons that, that are, that have the same quantum numbers. Uh, so if you have aligned spins, but in this case, if you have aligned orbital degree of freedom, the circulation direction, the electrons stay away from each other more efficiently. And so at three quarters filling, which is one hole in the band for every more A cell, it turns out it's favorable for all of them to circulate the same way. Okay, but the, the, the circulating current is independent of the magnetic field or is it generated by the magnetic field? Uh, no, it's, it's in the ground state at zero magnetic field. Okay. It's just that these little circulating currents like to line up. So if we didn't okay. apply any field in the first place, we would get a, a bunch of domains. So we'd have regions where the circulating current would go one direction, regions where they go the other direction. It's a lower energy if they can all go the same direction, but we need to help that out by putting on a field and then coming back to zero. Okay, okay. So any, any more questions, uh, Edson? Hey, hey, uh, thank you, Dave, for your nice talk. And uh, I, I have a, a further question this, uh, along the line of uh, George's question. And, uh, and, and my question is, do you have a, a spatial resolution where these this little magnetic um, moments that come from these uh, circulated current are located on the surface? Like, are they special, special uh, uh, cells of these, uh, these uh, um, molecular particles? So yes, so Edson was asking, uh, can we see where the where where these these orbital moments are? So each of them has the size of one of the Moray cells, um, and uh, theoretic. So that's about ten nanometers. I didn't mention that, but that's much bigger than an atomic uh, spacing, but it's still very tiny on almost any other scale. Um, uh, in my group, we don't have. Uh, a technique for uh, for spatially imaging that um, the um, so we can map out the more spatially uh, using an atomic force microscope um, that's not sensitive directly to the magnetism and we do it at room temperature uh, so there are groups that do scanning tunneling microscopy that can actually image um, these um, uh, the electronic states that give rise to these orbital moments. Um, and uh, there's also theoretical work, um, and the, the STM work agrees with the theory in saying that these wave functions live primarily on these AA regions, the energetically unfavorable structural regions. Um, but um, these, so you get three petals of a flower that is centered in an AB region, but the um, the weight of the wave function is at the three, at the three boundaries at these three corners. So yes, we we have a pretty good idea of what those wave functions are. There's some validation from STM, uh, but um, mapping out domains can be done, and that's been done uh, by Andrea's group using a, a scanning squid that has uh, 100 nanometer resolution or so. But getting down within the Moray cell. STM is the um, the main real space technique. So, so I I know there may be more questions, but I I should probably wrap up, and I'm sure that some of the audience also needs to. Um, so, um, is is there one other very quick thing, or um, I I would have one one last question. Uh, if I understand correctly, the the top. Uh, born nitride is the one that is part of the system that is generating the circulating current, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see it using STM if the circulating current was just in the bilayer graphene, right? Um, so STM, uh, they have to make a different structure. They have to have the bilayer graphene on top because oh, okay. born nitride is... Uh, an insulator. An insulator, sure. More than I, my group, together with Hari Manoharan's group at Stanford, have shown uh, that we can do nice tunneling through a single monolayer of boron nitride uh, into a, 
um, a material below, uh, but um, but if you have a thick layer of boron nitride, uh, that's impossible. Um, so uh, so the STM samples are boron nitride on the bottom and then the twisted bilayer on top, so they have to make okay. it a bit differently. Okay, I, I understand that. Okay, so uh, David, thank you very much. Uh, it was a very, very nice talk and uh, I will I will be sending you an email to ask for the slides so we can post the slides if, if you allow us. Great. Post the slide together with the video. And then uh, in that email, I will mention also the uh, conference uh, next year that we will be inviting you. Great. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, Edson, Thank you. and thanks, everyone. Thank you. So, bye-bye. Okay. Uh, muito bom, hein, professor? <laughs>